Thank you. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I want to talk today a little bit about what I call one of the biggest misunderstandings or the number one myth about money that's out there. We have this tremendous idea about this particular subject, we as finite human beings, and if we don't crush this wrong idea that we have and do away with this myth, we never blossom and grow into what we're supposed to grow into. I need to get two folks to come up here and help me for just a minute, just to kind of lay this thing out so you'll see it. Can I get you two men to come up here and join me for just a minute, please? Thanks. I promise I'm not going to mess with you or make fun of you or not too much or anything like that and uh, so forth. Just, just one of you stand right here and one of you stand right here. And I'm Dave. Brian. Brian, good to meet you. Lee. Lee, good to meet you. Okay, just stand right there and face the audience. And uh, Again, I'm not going to walk around behind you and make funny signs or bunny ears or anything like that. But okay, Brian, here's what we're going to do. This is $1,000. It is 10 $100 bills. This is my most expensive visual aid. <laughs> my wife says I can come home, but not without the visual aid. <laughs> Got the picture, yeah. okay? All right, I need you to hold that for a second. Okay, now Brian is going to... <laughs> you gotta watch him. <laughs> Brian is going to represent for a few minutes you and me. Okay, and Lee here, dressed the way he is, is going to represent our local banker. Just, I'm, I'm not picking on your dress, it just doesn't look particularly banking, which is, I probably should have used this guy for the banker, but that's okay. It's, you know, bankers aren't doing as good these days, we'll let him, you know, be the banker. Okay, now. <laughs> no, I mean, you're cool, it's just not real banking-esque. Okay, now. Probably costs more than a banker suit, you know, with all the wisdom. But okay, so Lee is going to represent our local banker. Now, Brian, are you married, sir? I am. Okay, is your wife here by chance? She's not. Okay, she's not here. But well, Brian, how long have you been married? Uh, five years. Five years. Okay, Brian's been married long enough, like I have, that guys start to understand there are some things we don't get, but it doesn't matter. We still got to do what we're supposed to do. We don't always know what it is. It's a mystery. But, but one of those things, for instance, is Brian's wife comes in one morning, they've worked really hard, and they've finally gotten home with $1,000 and have saved up that money. And, and now they've saved up the money, and they're going to open a bank account and put the money in savings in Lee's bank. Now, open the bank account. All right. <laughs> a joyful banker. Good. Now... All right, so now, now Lee's, you know, we've made a deposit into Lee's bank, and, and he's watching over, look, he's watching over Brian's money. Now, Brian's wife comes in one morning and says, honey, I have decided that we need a china cabinet. Now, guys, men don't understand china that we never eat on, and we really do not understand a $2,000 cabinet to put it in. It just does not compute in the guy brain. But if you've been married a little while, it, you know it doesn't matter. She wants a china cabinet, Papa gets a china cabinet. This is how it does. So Brian goes down to the bank to get the money out of the bank. Not yet, not yet, be calm. He goes down to get the money out of the bank and he comes in and he walks up to the teller and the teller says, she gets this deer in the headlights look, kind of white, and her blood drains from her face and she says, oh no. Lee wants to see you in his office. You're that Brian. So he goes in Lee's office. Hey, Lee, what's going on? And, and Lee would never really do this, so don't you guys make fun of him later. It's just an example. He was nice enough to come up here. But, but they come into Lee's office, and, 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 and Lee kind of gets that same look in his face. He says, Brian, I need you to sit down. He said, I've, I've got some bad news. He said, I, I, I work here at the bank. We don't make a lot of money at the bank. And, 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 and we needed to go on a cruise. I, I needed a new car. And, and my kids needed to go to college, and I didn't have the money, and so I, I took your money, and I used it to buy some stuff for me. Is that okay? Now, this is you and me. Remember, Brian represents you and me. He just took your money. Now, he would never really do this, but it's a good example. And, and so, I mean, Brian kind of looks around, thinks there's a joke. Somebody at the church is playing a joke on him. He's looking for the camera where they're going to play it back during service later, you know, or something. 
And, and, but in a minute, he starts to realize this guy has stolen his $1,000. He's misused the trust. Because, see, when you make a deposit into a bank, in legal terms, what a lawyer would tell you is you have just placed in that bank a fiduciary trust responsibility. That bank is not, it's not that bank's money. They're holding the money for you. Then they misused it for their own good. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm from Tennessee. We would have what I call a duck fit. I mean, I'd lose my religion in about a minute and a half. I want my money. Anybody else with me? I want my money. Took my money. Well, let's change their names just for a second. Instead of this position representing you and I, and this position representing a bank, let's tell you the way it really is out there. The way it really is is this position really represents God. And this position really represents you and I. You see, he placed in our hands resources, money, stuff, time, talents. And they're not ours. He owns it. God owns it all. The psalmist says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God owns it all. We don't own squat. You don't own anything. Your little mutual funds, your 401k that now looks like a 201k. (laughs) It's not yours. Quit worrying about it. That car, my car, it's not your car. Even those kids aren't yours. I told mine, if they don't straighten up, we're going to send them on ahead. (laughs) It's not yours. You and I are just managers. We have a fiduciary trust responsibility with the owner to do with his stuff as he tells us to do with his stuff. I have 250 people that work for me on my team at my company. I have 14 different profit centers, vice presidents running those profit centers. Each one of those have profit and loss responsibility. You know what they do with money? What I want them to. Or you don't get to work there anymore because I own the company. You're going to do it by Dave's instructions. Am I intimidating? Uh Uh-huh. You're going to do it this way. This is the way to do it. Now, you can argue with me, but at the end of the day, what we all decide we're going to do, you better be doing that. This isn't yours to goof off with. It's not yours. You don't own it. You're managing it for me. I'm the owner. We are managing it for God. He is the owner. Right here. Give these guys a round of applause. Good job, guys. Thank you very much. And I didn't grow up in church, and I started going to church, and they started saying things like, you need to be a steward of your money. Well, what's that? What's a steward? Well, it, it's Christian talk for we're getting ready to build a building. <laughs> you need to be a steward of your money. Steward this, steward that, steward this. And I kept hearing all these terms, and I was like, you need to be a steward of my money. And so I looked up what a steward is. At Webster says a steward is someone who manages another's financial affairs. It's an asset manager. Go figure. It's an old English term, actually. It's not an American term. We never use the term in North America, except to, uh, and, and really it's not used around the world anymore, except among Christians. If someone says, steward your money, I immediately know somewhere they've had contact with somebody who had a Bible. Because it doesn't come up in financial circles. I'm going to go down to Merrill Lynch and get me a steward. It doesn't come up that way. We call them asset managers out there in the real world, don't we? And we say, this is someone who manages money for someone else. That's all it is. So stewardship is managership. That's all it is. It's no more than that. A couple of years ago, my wife and I, I mean, because, you know, it's like we said, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He owns it. We don't own it. You got to start there. And it changes the way you handle debt. If it's not yours to go into debt with in the first place. It changes the way you do a budget because you're doing a budget. It's budget time at the corporation. If you ever worked for a company and they said do budgets, you do a budget if you want to keep your job. Hello, that's God. Do a budget. You know, it it changes the way you give because it isn't your money to give. A couple of years ago, my wife and I were blessed to get to travel a little bit in Europe. And we found uh, this castle there that is the Ramsey Castle. Bet you didn't have a castle. I was pretty impressed. And, and, you know, it's not a castle anymore. Now it's a five-star bed and breakfast. So guess who stayed there while we 
going to stay in the Ramsey Castle, baby. The Dungeon's a five-star restaurant. Good stuff. Dalhousie, it's called. So we visited, the Ramseys visited Dalhousie. It's quite a castle right there in, you know, right there in Scotland, right outside of Edinburgh. It's very cool. Go there, and we went around, and they said, we checked in. Oh, you're Ramseys. Yes. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> well, you'll want to meet Andrew. And so we got to meet Andrew. He came down and interrupted our dinner, and he would not shut up. And he talked and talked and talked and talked. He told us every detail of every part of the castle. We took a two and a half hour tour of the castle. We didn't want to take. It wasn't optional. And, and, but we did get a picture with Andrew. He's complete there in his kilt. And he's standing on top of the castle. There's Dave with Andrew. You know what Andrew's title was? He's the steward of the castle. Andrew is not a Ramsey. He's not one of the owners. He's a person who looks after and watches and cares for and makes sure that the castle is getting good use. You're not allowed to move anything in the castle that is of historic value without first checking with Andrew. He is in charge of making sure the castle is taken care of for the owners. He's a steward. That's where the old English Bible, King James Version, picked up steward because that was the mindset of people in that mentality feudal England, a steward was someone who was not the owner. They were not the nobles in the castle. They were the guys and gals who managed everything for the nobles in the castle. And so when the King James Version was translated, it was like, you're just a steward. And everybody in that economy went, oh, cool, I got it. I don't own anything. God owns it all. Fast forward now, and we use it for fundraising because we forgot the real core essence of you're not an owner. You're just a manager. That's all you are. And then I was in church, and I, I, a baby Christian, and the preacher said, and you need to give a tithe. I said, what's that? He said, you need to give a tithe of your income to the local church. I said, what's that? He said, it's 10% of your income ought to come to the local church. I went, says you, you want me to give you 10% of my money? Yeah, show me where it says that. And he said, here, 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 and here. And I went, would you write that? Because I was a baby Christian. I, this stuff, I mean, because I always heard all that church wants is your money. Have you heard that one? You know, and, and so a preacher starts preaching, and I'm supposed to give them money. I was like, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, no, shields up. Like, I've got the gift of cynicism. And, and, and so he, uh, he sat down and lovingly walked me through it. He explained to me the word tithe literally in Hebrew means tent. Because I had one guy said, I tell my people to, to tithe 5% of their income at first. Well, you can tell them to give 5% if you want, but the tithe means tenth, and you really can't 20th a tenth. It means tenth. Now, if you don't want to give a tithe, that's okay. You're not going to hell. That's not the issue. It's not a salvation issue. It's just an instruction on money from the owner of the castle. And you're just a manager. And one of the management, the policies and procedures of this organization is that you give a tenth of your income into the local church. Are you going to hell if you don't? No. And you can go to hell if you do. You can. There's a guy in Matthew. He does. Jesus said that one's going to hell because he talked about his tithing and he didn't know Jesus. See, Jesus is the heaven thing. Tithing, these are side issues over here. Okay? So it's not a salvation issue. And God doesn't go, oh, I like that one better. <laughs> Come on. Really? I mean, there, you messed up enough stuff that if you tithe like perfect to the penny the rest of your life, it just raises your standard about like that much, okay? So let's just be real. Grace covers you and me, thank goodness, okay? Thank goodness. This is not what this is about. But the tithe goes to the local church. The preacher's going, give me a tithe. I'm going, I think I'm going to do that. And I really struggled with this. I re when I first started working with God, this was a hard thing for me to give a tenth of my income to the local church. But when it snapped, when I got it, I changed forever, and I've never missed one time. No matter what, whether I was mad at the church, ever get mad at your church? If you don't, you're not involved. <laughs> or you're in a cult, one. I mean, come on. Really, you know? You get mad. Sometimes they just, they just look goofy, you know? Quit being goofy, and you just get aggravated, but you tithe anyway, because that's where you trust your kids to learn about Jesus. It's where you learn about your marriage. It's where you learn about your spiritual walk. You, that's where you're being fed. 
So you give the tenth of your income there. And I got thinking, okay, well, now, why does God want us to give a tenth of our income to the local church? Okay, it's because the church needs our money. You know, I've sat on church boards. Now, I'm going to freak some people out right now. Some of the preachers are just going, they're going to fall over right here. <laughs> that church does not need your money. Now, they'll never buy the DVD series, will they? No, seriously, that church does not need your money. You know what that church needs? It needs your involvement, your leadership. It needs you to love Jesus, and the natural byproduct of that is you're going to be a tither. That's what it needs. Well, God needs your money. That's why, that's why the Bible says to tithe, because God needs your money to do his work on the earth. <laughs> God needs your money. That is so arrogant. And I was. I'm going to help God out. Here comes the plate. I'm going to tip him like he's a waitress. God needs your money. If God wants your money, he'll take it and there'll be a greasy spot where you were sitting. <laughs> God needs your money. I mean, come on. So why does God want us to be giving a tenth? And why do we have offerings to other ministries and do other giving? Why is giving a part of the Christian walk? Why is, as we weave the, the scarlet thread of redemption from Genesis to maps all the way through the Scripture, why is it that, that God takes us all the way through that process and all the way through there it's always about us being a giver because he's trying to make us over like his kid he wants us to be Christ like and Christ is a giver God's a giver he, we got his DNA in our spirit it's, we are children of his we can't look like him walk like him present well for him unless we're like him and he's a giver He's trying to make us over. You know, it says in Genesis that you and I are made in His, in his image. And that's what He's doing. He's trying to make us over in His own image. So I'm sitting one morning, and I wish I could tell you I've got like this holy man discipline in my life. I don't. I run like crazy. And one day is one way and another day is another way. And so I don't have this perfect quiet time thing that some of you think you're supposed to have every day. And it's cool if you do, but I don't. I just I don't function that way. So my stuff's kind of hit or miss. But one morning I got up and I was holy. <laughs> and I got up early and I was, it was real early. I mean, the sun wasn't even up and I'm sitting in my office and I'm reading scripture, going through, you know, Bible in a year thing. I'm, I'm doing my deal, right? And, and, and my son, who's now a, a grown young man, at that time he was about four years old, three years old, four years old, and he wakes up. I'm sitting in my study. Nobody else is up. A and here he comes dragging his little blanket down the stairs with the little Spider-Man pajamas, you know, and they've kind of grown a lot, so they're kind of hitting him a little high, you know. <laughs> and he's been sliding in home base, so there's a hole in one knee. You know, you see the picture, and the hair's kind of going all crazy. No teeth. And he just kind of comes in that hair like that into my study like this. And I'm like, oh, baby, you don't need to get up. You need to go back to bed because you're going to be grouchy and get a beating later. You don't want to do that. <laughs> so, you know, honey, honey, you need to go back to bed now, right? And he said, can I just sit with you for a little while, Dad? And I said, well, sure, baby. I've got two daughters that are older than him and then my only son. And so he climbed up in my lap, and we were just sitting there kind of hanging out. And I was looking at the Bible in my hand. He said, what are you reading? And I said, well, I was just reading here. And it just hit me. And before I realized it, I was just crying. He said, Daddy, what's wrong? Did I do something wrong? I said, no, baby, you didn't do anything wrong. I've read this a thousand times, honey, and I just read it again this morning. That God gave his only son. And I got to tell you, I can't. No matter how old I get, no matter how long I've been doing this, I can't get past that. It's unbelievable. There I'm sitting holding my only son. I said, honey, if, if I had to give you up for all those people, they'd be out of luck. I couldn't do it. I can't imagine the heartache of a father who made a sacrifice at that level. You and I are made in his image. 
We are designed from the foundations of the world to be givers. It is who we are. And when we don't make that a part of our process and how we handle our lives, it caves in on us. And suddenly, our lives get foggy, stressful. Relationships start to break down because we're not functioning the way we were designed to function. When we start to give, it turns things loose. We become more creative. We become more passionate. It changes our relationships. We breathe deeper. It's weird. When you start to give of yourself, of your talents, and of your treasure, it changes you. That's why God wants me to give. He's molding me and making me over a little better every day. I remember the first time I made $10,000 and I gave a $1,000 tithe check. Big dog. Years now have passed. And I've been blessed to be able to do that many, many times over. Some days, many times over in one check. But that first one broke something loose inside of me. I was a little prideful, I'll be honest, about being able to give that much. To be that much of a blessing. Dave, you're a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know what you do. I do it. You do it too, don't you? But then after you've done it for years and years and years and years and years and years and years, and the tithe becomes part of the rhythm of your life just like breathing, just like letting the dogs out in the morning when you get up, you know? It becomes part of the rhythm of your life. You have changed. I was speaking at a big church the other day, and the pastor told me he'd been pastoring 35 years, and he's never had a couple who were in agreement on tithing that had been tithing over an extended period of time get a divorce. And I went, well, that's weird. Are you saying that's like a spiritual protection for marriage? And he said, well, sort of. He said, really what it is, is when you tithe, it's hard to be selfish, and when you're less selfish, you're a better husband, and you're a better daddy, and you're a better employer, and you're a better employee. Employees who tithe tend to get promoted, and it's not magical and mystical, tithe, zap. No. (laughs) It's not what happens. What happens is you tithe, you're a better person. People notice that. They don't know you're tithing. They just see you're more giving as a person. Those are the people we tend to promote because we're the ones we want around us in leadership. Hello. That's what happens. Greedy, stingy, it's all about me, people. These are are people you fire. First, first wave of layoffs. Greedy, stingy, take them out. That's the first ones. It's what you do. You don't want to be around them. You prosper when you give. That's why it's very practical because it changes who you are. God teaches us to tithe because it's a reminder of ownership. When I give a tenth of my income on Sunday morning, when I hit the plate with that baby, that's my AA group. My name is Dave and I like stuff. (laughs) Here, God, it's all yours. I am just one more Sunday reminded I'm not the owner. I'm the manager. You are the owner. That's what tithing does for me. It reminds me of that. It's a reminder. It's a kick. Boom. Okay, got it. The second thing the tithe is, is is, is praise and worship. I love praise and worship. I cannot sing at all. I live in Music City, Nashville, Tennessee. Can't sing a note. I'm on talk radio for a reason. (laughs) I make a joyful noise in church. But I love praise and worship. Just bathe in it. Just love the music flowing over me. Me singing at the top of my lungs, disturbing everybody around me. I have to keep my eyes closed because they're all looking at me. I love praise and worship. If Michael W. Smith, my buddy, ever heard me sing any of his songs in my car by myself, he would run off the road laughing. <laughs> but I love singing his songs. I love singing that stuff. Ah, oh, it's wonderful. And then sometimes in some churches we take halftime right up to praise and worship before the big event. We're going to have halftime, and that's when we pass the plate. No, that's praise and worship. When the plate is passed, when, when you give your giving, that's, Jesus, I love you. You're in charge. I do not own it. You own it. See, you're a cheerful giver. When you look the word cheerful up in the Greek, it means it's the word helios, where we get our word hilarious. So next time you're giving, just bust out and go, ha, ha, ha. Have a little fun with it, people. They'll think your church went charismatic. Be careful. Have some fun with it. Bust out, man. 
You know, enjoy this. Be cheerful about the process. Don't be going, I'm a good Christian Boy Scout, and this is my duty to do my best to give my tithe. See, Jesus, I love you. <laughs> this is not cheerful. This is not cheerful. Cheerful is you gave it and you forget instantly. We were sitting in church the other day, and my middle child who's in college was home for the weekend, and she was sitting beside me and had the tithe check, and I pulled it out, and I showed it to my wife. She'd already seen it, but I always, before I put it in, I opened it up so she knows again, because we budget together. This is what it is, and I fold it in half, and I laid it in the thing, and my kid reaches for the check. <laughs> now, she wasn't going to take it. She just wanted to know what it was. And I'm like, none ya. None ya business. And, and I just pushed her, and I said, you don't need to know what that is. And she, she sat there a minute, and we sung a song or something, and come in it, she kind of leaned over and laid her head on my shoulder, and she said, I've watched you tithe my whole life. Thank you for putting that visually in, in my face to be a giver ever since I can remember. It's one of my earliest memories. Change your family tree. That's what it'll do. You want to teach your children to be givers? You better be one. They're watching. I'm not perfect. That was a cool moment. You got to have a few of those cool moments because you, if you raise teenagers, you need some cool moments after that. <laughs> the third thing is giving is spiritual warfare. I was always taught to pray on the armor of God. Have you heard that one? Where you put on the helmet of salvation, you gird your waist in truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, hold the shield of faith, shod your feet in the gospel, hold the sword of the word in your hand, be ready to do battle out there. You just get, get armored up. You're ready to go fight. Now, some people are freaked out about this devil stuff. I've met them. I've been all over the place. And again, I didn't grow up in church, so it kind of, it kind of tickles me. They're all worried about the devil. It's, it, but I read the back of the book, we win. <laughs> I, I am not. <laughs> he's a smart, scary dude, and he's bigger than me and smarter than me and all that stuff, but all that. But Jesus makes him look like a little wimpy boy. So, I mean, it's just like, you know, Jesus looked at those pigs and just said, leave. And millions of spirits just went, Poof, just like that. Just one word, just go. That's all he said, go. That's pretty powerful. Big Jesus, little devil. It's okay. <laughs> but you know what? It's spiritual warfare. You want to you you put on the armor of God and keep your, your family protected from this guy who's out there who's real. He's a real guy. He wants you. He wants to mess with you. I'm convinced there's a demon of water pumps for your car. He's out there on your car right now going, ding, 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 right? And, and the Bible says in Malachi, if you tithe, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Now, that's very biblical sounding, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And I don't know how you see this, but the way I figure it is, is there's big, bad, square-shouldered angels with flaming swords. And that demon is trying to get at my teenager, and he just goes, <laughs> Star Wars kind of, you know? Star Wars meets Frank Peretti right? And you just, and you know, so he just walks out there to your car and drops that sword down through the hood and just skewers him. Says, come here, little wiggler, get off that car. <laughs> right? Now, you can look at this however you want, and I'm kind of got a weird imagination, but I think all that's kind of biblical if you look it up. <laughs> Not about the water pump part, but <laughs> seriously, I mean, he's going to rebuke the devourer for your sake. So you put on the armor of God, and you don't tithe? Tithe is spiritual warfare. That's what that's referring to. Malachi is the preeminent tithing scripture. If you ever want to study the tithe, it's all in that one scripture just about. And, and, and so if you go look at that thing, it just says, test me, and this says the Lord of hosts. And he lists several things about the tithe. The Lord says, try him out. I'll give you that challenge. Try him out. Tithe for 90 days. If you don't like it, you can always quit. It'll freak you out. Now, a message to all the pastors across that are listening to us right now, quit teaching on tithing. I just did a really good job, but you quit. <laughs> you need to teach three, de three lessons on getting out of debt and two lessons on preaching. I mean, on, on doing a two lessons on preaching. Three lessons on, <laughs> three lessons on getting out of debt and two lessons on budgeting for every giving lesson you teach. Because if you'll get people out of debt and get them on a budget, they naturally will give because people in your congregations love Jesus. And they're not giving not because they don't want to, not because they don't know to. They're not giving because they're broke. And they're having to make a choice between the light bill, feeding their kid, car getting repoed. But if you'll get them out of debt, you'll see your giving go up immediately as a natural byproduct, and you won't even have to mention it. It's a natural thing that happens all the time. 
So ultimately, God has us to give because He wants to make us over in His image. The tithe is to the local church, and above that is doing cool stuff in Jesus' name, which we're going to close up with cool stuff in Jesus' name. You don't want to miss this piece. You know how sometimes it feels like life just happens? You know, just random things seem to fill your day. Things with little or no consequence to anyone else. I mean, I know God's in control of my life, but I never really saw how much He was weaving my story with other people's stories, and really, into His story. Well, that's all changed. It was a cold day, the kind where you really don't want to have some long conversation outside with someone, especially with someone you don't really know. But that's exactly what God had in mind. Amy and I had just eaten lunch at Dumplin's downtown Franklin, and we were walking to the car and we see this couple that I thought I recognized from church. It would have been awkward just to walk by them and not say anything, so we stopped and said hey and did the whole, yeah, yeah, you guys go to fellowship thing, whatever. Well, we start talking and the whole Dave Ramsey thing comes up. They asked us where we were in the process, and I told them that so far we paid off 60000 but still had $10,000 left to go. They asked us what we would do when we were debt-free, and I laughed and told them, well, I told my kids I'd buy them a trampoline, but we really wanted to adopt, and we committed to being debt-free before we did. The whole conversation only lasted about three minutes. It was like, nice to meet you. That was random. Well... The next day, that random person shows up at my office with this brand new trampoline. I couldn't believe it. It was like my kids are gonna freak. I set it up that night and my kids jumped on that thing for four hours. I mean, we didn't even know these people. They didn't have to do that. I mean, really, that's pretty generous. Well, the next day I get an email from the same lady saying, oh, you guys seem like a sharp couple and we'd love to come by and talk to you about something. I emailed her back and said, that sounds like a multi-level marketing proposal. And if it was, we really weren't interested. Of course, she says it's not that sort of deal, but she was really persistent. She even called Amy. Amy had been sick and it really wasn't a great time to have company over. Our house is a wreck and we didn't feel like picking it up. We said everything short of, please don't come over to my house. So they show up and I'm like, here we go. Let's get this over with. Don't say yes to anything. I couldn't believe they sunk their claws into us with that trampoline to get us involved in some pyramid scheme. Anyway, so we small talked for about five minutes, and then right when I thought they were about to drop the bomb, they did. But it wasn't the bomb I was expecting. So the lady says, well, we told you we'd only be a few minutes, and I really don't know how to say this, but we want to pay off your $10,000 left in debt so you guys can adopt. She pulls out her checkbook and goes, how do you spell your guys' names? What? Are you kidding me? Are you for real? I mean, who does that? Who writes somebody a check for $10,000 and gives it to people they don't even know? So they give us a check and they said, just don't act weird around us at church and just don't tell anybody it was us. And they drove off. I mean, Amy and I stood there for 10 minutes in total shock. And we cried and we screamed. And we ran all over the yard and the house. Unbelievable. I mean, seriously, it was beyond belief. We realized nine months later when we brought Malaya home, the check they wrote us was dated nine months prior to Malaya's due date. They gave us that money right about the time our daughter was conceived. It was like God was saying, I have a baby out there for you right now. I'm not waiting around another two years for you to pay off that debt. We felt called to adopt, but we simply couldn't afford to do it on our own. We found that this random couple had already adopted four children and felt a calling to continue to serve through adoption. Rather than bringing more children into their home, they decided to help others adopt. It didn't just happen. It wasn't random at all. God knew His plan. He had just invited us to walk with Him through this process. He was weaving our callings, our stories together for us to love and to care for each other, to make a beautiful tapestry for His glory. Thank you, Jesus.